Welcome, everything is fine. You are listening to Forking Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We'll be the ethical sleeper agents of your journey into the afterlife. This week we'll be talking about Season 4, Episode 1, A Girl from Arizona, Part 1. It was written by Andrew Law and Cassie Miller. It was directed by Drew Goddard. This episode aired September 26, 2019. So let's get straight into the recap. Eleanor welcomes Chidi to the neighborhood. She's clearly upset, but doesn't want to show it. Welcome to the good place, Chidi. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm I'm sorry, this has been so overwhelming, I, I forgot your name. Eleanor. Eleanor! Right. Sorry. Eleanor. 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 Now I'll never forget. Well, you might. <laughs> Both Michael and Sean bolster their team with a rousing speech. They're raring to go with their experiment. Eleanor introduces two new subjects to the neighborhood. Linda, a Norwegian woman who is the human equivalent of plain oatmeal, and Brent, a man who definitely voted for Trump. You can always ask Janet. Janet? Hi there, how can I help you? Oh, a secretary. Great. Not a secretary. Fine, fine. Executive assistant. Here we go with all the terms we gotta learn, right? Vice president of helping. <laughs> Captain Marvel. You know what I'm saying. Well, I'm not part of this. The team gathers at Mindy's house. Matt from accounting has been assigned to their project, but no one will know the point totals in real time. The team thinks they have Simone all figured out, but it turns out that she's convinced none of this is real. They decide they need Chidi to help Simone. Eleanor's resistant, claiming that Simone's not struggling with a philosophy problem. Derek roams the neighborhood, bothering both Jason and Janet. Derek makes it clear he wants Janet back, so Jason reboots him without hesitation. Eleanor agrees to introduce Simone to Chidi, but they don't make a connection. Semi-charmed kind of life, baby. Okay, well, uh, nice meeting you. Oh, nice to meet you too. Cute guy generated by my rapidly decaying temporal load. Derek's head appears in the sky, alerting residents to his murder. The team decides to refocus their efforts on Linda. Michael and Eleanor try to get her out of her shell, and she cracks, punching both of them and then attacking the other residents. They discover Linda was a demon in disguise, sent by the bad place to undermine the experiment. The judge intervenes, ruling that Chidi will be the fourth subject. Okay, fine, yes, busted. I'm a rascal. If you so much as breathe on this experiment again, I will restart the entire thing from scratch. And then I will personally rip off your eyelids and make you watch heartwarming videos of soldiers coming home to their dogs. Bad Janet comes to the neighborhood via train to pick up the demon. Michael and Janet put him on the train and the demons leave. And that's part one. The stage has been set. Yeah, that's basically this episode is just laying the groundwork. Yeah, okay, so let's just start off with that. What did you think of the episode? I thought it was good. It was a perfectly acceptable season slash series premiere finale setup. (laughs) It was really great to see everyone again, Mm -hmm. and I missed everyone. I'm glad we got to see Bad Janet even briefly. (laughs) Um, It's not my fault. I was texting. (laughs) (laughs) She's like Jeff in community, just always texting. Right. Probably not to anybody in particular, just thumbs going. Who would she be texting anyway? It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Texting Trevor Dank memes. Oh my god. Oh, maybe. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I felt kind of the same like there were some really funny jokes when you and I were watching it together I was pretty much like laughing every couple of seconds but otherwise it basically felt like it was a setup for the season Mm -hmm. we already kind of assumed that Chidi was gonna be the final subject so we just needed to find a way to get there because it makes more sense to have the bad place plant someone than it does for them to anticipate what Chidi's going to do and then Assume that he will be the one torturing Eleanor. Yeah, that just seems like a lot more work than they'd be willing to put into it. Like, what's the quickest way we can screw things up? We'll just throw a sleeper agent in there. Yeah, I'm happy that Linda didn't stick around any longer because she's so boring. So boring. (laughs) Like, that's the point is she's infuriatingly boring. But But that shtick gets really old really quickly. Yeah. So you definitely can't have that go on for very long. Yes. (laughs) I expected something was going to happen to make Chidi the fourth subject. Mm -hmm. I'm still surprised. 
Oh yeah, as soon as yeah. Linda punched Eleanor in the face, I my jaw dropped. I'm yeah. like, I did not expect that. <laughs> I didn't see that coming whatsoever. It was fantastic. And you're like, oh wait, was Linda like secretly really cool? Like she was a spy and she <laughs> killed a bunch of people or she, like she was an assassin or maybe mm-hmm. she was really into MMA? No, she just a demon. Mm-hmm. And by the way, they totally set that up earlier in the episode when the one question she asks is, is there a fitness center around here? And we all know that Chris the Demon loves to go to the gym. Heck yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it doesn't really look like Linda works out a whole lot. She's not super buff. I mean... Doesn't have mad pipes. She's unassuming. She's the perfect assassin. I'm just saying they could have gotten with that story. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's good to see that the bad place is still up to their old tricks. And I really, really doubt that this is the end of their sabotaging. No, of course not. (laughs) As many people have pointed out online, there's a very good possibility that Michael's not Michael. Yeah, I'm afraid about that. Because we saw in the recap that the bad place created a Michael suit... And then when Michael gets on the train to put Chris on there, he comes back and he looks the same and he's acting the same, but... They all know Michael because they've worked with him for a long time. So, I mean, the demons I'm talking about. Yeah. So, I don't know. It, It would be kind of a bummer if that was the final, like, end game reveal, which I doubt it will be. Mm-hmm. I think it would be, like, a next episode they figure it right, out. Right, exactly. Of thing. And that's fine. I'm cool with that because they can't have that be, like, a final big twist reveal thing. Like, right. It just. Yeah, I mean, I think that they need to do something with that Michael suit. I just hope it's not a, oh, at the end of this season, it turns out it wasn't Michael all along. Or, But at the same time, they just planted somebody, so it'd be kind of silly to do a part two of, oh, look, we did another plant. Yeah, but that seems exactly like what the bad place would do. Like, well, they'd never think of us being dumb enough to do it again. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're going to do it again. (laughs) The judge did say, though, that if they did anything else, she was going to restart the entire experiment. So that's kind of on the back of my mind, is that maybe that's what they want to do. They want to, like, restart it. It's almost, it's almost a fear. Like, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how many times are we going to reboot this? Is that what's going to happen here? These poor people's brains are getting addled. (laughs) Enough. No more reboots. (laughs) Well, I've got some thoughts about that later on. Um, another good little bit of like housekeeping that we do in this episode is finding out that Matt from accounting has been assigned to this project. He must be so happy. So happy to not deal with weird sex things, you know, no more. I was going to say Stonehenge, but that's not it. Although apparently that was a weird sex thing. Uh, Burning Man. That's Mm. what I was thinking of. Burning Man. (laughs) Yeah. Finding out that no one's going to know the point totals until the end of the experiment. I think that that's a really good call. Yeah, absolutely. It means that Michael can't adjust the experiment or the neighborhood in case things aren't working out. Exactly. There's no, "Mm, well, this guy's kind of dipping, so he needs to spend more time with Chidi. Mm -hmm. No. It reminded me a lot of season one when Michael, you know, accidentally let Tahani see the point totals and she just like, she just kept doing things trying to increase her point, point total not realizing that it had ended when she died. Yeah. And we just don't want people constantly checking in. We don't want, like, point totals above people's heads, like they're the Sims or something. Right, like when Michael and Janet were watching the the stock ticker devices at the end of season, or the end of season two and the beginning of season three. Yeah. So, none of that. Yeah, this leaves more suspense. Yeah. For sure. And we also got to see another side of Janet, which is great. Mm -hmm. Not her happy, cheery, happy-go-lucky Janet. She's (laughs) getting pretty annoyed. She's showing different emotions now. Like, not pleased. A little high strung. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Well, I would be too if, you know, I'm doing literally everything and then Brent is calling me because he wants a BLT. Oh, my God. Make it yourself. Oh, my God. I hate him. (laughs) Okay. I'm worried about Janet. I'm genuinely worried about her. She said so many times in this episode how overwhelmed she is. She is barely keeping it together as far as like being pleasant with people. Mm -hmm. 
And people just keep adding stuff. Even though she keeps telling everyone that she has other things to do. Yeah, even Michael. Yeah, Michael, Eleanor, everybody. She's going to blow. I'm concerned. I believe that's going to be the key to the whole season. Well, Mm -hmm. Janet's going to be the key to the whole season. And I'm not quite sure how, but you can quote me on that. The key to season, just like she's the key to my heart. I get it. There you go. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm concerned because... Like, all the Janet babies, right? That's all kind of riding on her. So if she has a moment where she freaks out and everything just goes to hell, like, that's going to ruin the experiment. Do you think all the Janet babies are going to maybe start cracking or start breaking or... I don't know. I don't know. But I feel like... I feel like something bad's going to happen with these Janet babies. I do not trust them to behave like normal people. Mm Mm-hmm. And even in this episode, we see that they don't. When Simone pushes some of them into the pool, they just kind of, oh, oh, I'm in the pool. I guess I'll get out of the pool now. If you were a real human being, you'd be wondering, what the heck is going on with the weird old lady shoving me into the pool? She's got cheese on her head. (laughs) And yeah, and then she's knocking over cupcakes and, you know, trying to unscrew some guy's head. Like, this, they're not reacting like normal human beings. Right. So I'm just concerned about how real they can maintain, like how real they can seem and how well she can maintain them. I know that she is brilliant and amazing, but I think everyone has their limits. Mm-hmm. And she is rapidly approaching hers, I would say. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about our newest resident. Can we not? Like, he doesn't deserve much airtime. I know. Okay, so you hate Brent? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't see how anybody couldn't hate Brent. <laughs> he kind of acts like the good place is just like, Matt's good enough. You know, he doesn't seem super jazzed by it. Is there golf? There friggin' better be. <sighs> and the way that he talks is like he's still alive. He's talking like, oh, we do vulcanized now, which I don't even know what that means. All I think of is Star Trek. Um, (laughs) He says, you know, oh, everyone's got to loosen up. And he's still calling people secretaries and Captain Marvel. And he's bringing up all this stuff. I don't know. Just like he's always looking at Michael, even though Eleanor is the architect Uh, He cuts down literally any woman or female presenting being. He does this like stupid sports move. I hate the sports move. Don't mind that you're doing golf. Oh, God, that's annoying. And then bringing up Captain Marvel, asking Janet to make him a BLT, all of these annoying things. I'm just like, you don't care about being a good person. You have zero desire to be a good person. So how the heck are you going to work in this experiment? Which is perfect from the bad places perspective. Mm -hmm. It makes me nervous. (laughs) He definitely doesn't seem like the type of person who would sit there in the audience and go, hmm, I don't think I did good things in my life. I probably don't deserve to be here. No, he's just thinking, when can I start golfing? Right. How is this supposed to work? Yeah. And that's that's going to be the issue. Yeah. But we all know a guy like this. We know several guys like this. (laughs) And Eleanor says that he's the one there to annoy her. But when she said that, I felt like that wasn't really true. Not that she wasn't his specific target. I mean, I think he's going to annoy little, literally everybody, including Michael and Janet. Mm-hmm. But I kind of wonder if Eleanor might have liked him when she was alive. Or might might have gotten along with him. What do you think? I think that could be the reason why he's there for her is because he reminds her of who she used to be. Right. Not, she wasn't nearly as bad as him. She didn't, she wasn't um, like sexist or misogynistic. Like she was just not a good person. She was an Arizona trash bag. She said it herself multiple times. Mm -hmm. And he just seems like a cruel person, like way worse than Eleanor was. Hmm. But I'm wondering if he's there to annoy Janet. (laughs) Maybe. I just think that Eleanor was never concerned with being a good person on Earth. Mm -hmm. Very similar to Brent. And Brent is the type of guy that Eleanor would have still supported as long as his business was close by and cheap enough. 
just like the guy way back in season one, Andy's Coffee. She finds out that he has been sexually harassing people and she does not care because the coffee place is so close by. Right. Right? So I kind of wonder if she's one of those people that would have defended him online. Like, oh yeah, people are taking those jokes way too seriously. You got to lighten up, you know? Because I think that's a little bit her. Hmm. So I suppose that works in your favor. Like what you were saying is that he's a bad person and she's grown since then. So hopefully now she will be annoyed by him because so what of was, the change. What was her catalyst when she was in the good place in season one, quote unquote, good place? Um, what was her trigger that made her realize she needed to get better? Knowing that she didn't belong. And that she would get kicked out if she didn't at least pretend to be a good person. Okay. So does that need to happen to him? That's my big issue with these four subjects is I don't know where that catalyst is going to come from. Right. They have to have a trigger. Like Mm -hmm. they can't just, the way it worked in season one, the way it worked the first time is Eleanor realizing that she needs to get better. Right. Eleanor and Jason were both certain that they didn't belong. They knew that they were the wrong person. Maybe they had either somebody else's spot, that kind of, exactly, mistaken identity. And Chidi felt like it was his moral duty to help. And Tahani just wanted to be liked by everybody. We don't have that, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what kind of scenarios they're going to give them because... It's not as though they introduced, oh, hey, you're John, but we're going to pretend that this John guy was actually a death row lawyer. And they didn't do that yet. Mm -hmm. They haven't set it up from the beginning. So this is a really different scenario. And I'm assuming the team has ideas of obstacles for them to overcome and that kind of thing. So they have to work together, get closer, be better. they're They're not recreating the experiment the same way. No. So... I don't know whether that's actually going to happen for this season. I feel like they're going to go in a different direction. Okay. And Which is smart in a way. Because we've seen it all before. We just, we don't want to see season one again with just new characters because mm-hmm. we don't like these characters. They're terrible people. <laughs> I think it could be kind of fun to see that for like one episode. Right. The dynamic of this group is going to be really different and I'm a little apprehensive about it. I kind of feel like they're just not going to re- be around that long. So I'm not getting attached to them. Also, Brent and John are terrible and I hate them. Both. And I don't want to get attached to them. I don't know. Another thing about this experiment in season one, Eleanor and Chidi were soulmates. So Chidi was duty bound to help her. Mm-hmm. He promised that he would never hurt her and he would stay by her side forever. I don't think there are soulmates in this version. Yeah. Again, we're missing that connection. Yeah. Yeah. There's been no mention of soulmates, so then Chidi's not really duty-bound to anybody. Yeah, Chidi's perfectly content with just saying, okay, nice to meet you, Simone. You're weird. I'm out. Yeah. Another part of the experiment that's lacking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. Shouldn't have let Michael plan this. (laughs) And then another thing is, even if Simone wasn't convinced that everything is a hallucination, she was a pretty good person on Earth. So I don't really think that she would believe she's a mistake and that she needs to improve for whatever reason. And she's also a lot less eager to please people than Tahani was. Mm -hmm. Tahani always wanted other people to like her, to admire her, to seem like she was the best person, right? I don't think Simone has any of those issues. No, she's perfectly content with cracking jokes and kind of poking fun at people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's good at calling Eleanor on her bullshit. Yes. In season three, when she was punching a hole in a cake and when she was rejecting cupcakes, like, oh, no, I don't want to get close to people. And oh, no, I'm afraid of losing people that care or that I care about. Yeah, exactly. Simone is perfectly capable of calling her out for that kind of stuff. So she's not going to take to Hani's place, I don't think. Mm -hmm. It's just a very different group. Very different. So should we talk about Simone? Yes. Okay. Let's talk about Simone. <laughs> I'm sure you have some ideas, philosophically speaking, and what she's going through. I do. Honestly, Simone's journey is the most interesting thing to me in this episode. Okay. For sure. 
I think that this presents a really new challenge for the team. Like, how are they going to convince her that the afterlife is real? Mm -hmm. Because right now she thinks everything is a result of her brain misfiring. So she's behaving kind of amorally. Mm -hmm. Not to say that she's behaving badly just because she wants to do bad things. It's just that she's not concerned with what's right and what's wrong and what's polite or what's appropriate. She doesn't care. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's pushing people into pools. She's twisting their heads. She's wearing insane clothes that she surprisingly looks good in. I agree with Eleanor. (laughs) Girl can pull anything off. And she's not even trying to connect to anybody, like, at all. She hears about Chidi, and his name just kind of goes, oh, it's probably, like, you know, random information leaking in my brain. That's it. Done. That's just so, I don't know, it's just so interesting. It's really fun to watch. And I'm concerned about how they're going to do this. Because Eleanor says she's not dealing with a philosophy issue, but I don't think that's true. I think Eleanor just hasn't learned about this yet. So the show is actually exploring something called solipsism, which is the viewer theory that only the self is sure to exist. Anything outside of one's mind is unsure. So the core idea is that you can doubt anything except your own mind. So nothing about the external world can be verified. and. It's possible that nothing outside of your mind even exists at all. So there's a couple different types of solipsism, but the one that they seem to be exploring with Simone is metaphysical solipsism, which claims that the self is the only reality that exists. Other realities like the external world and other people are just representations and extensions of oneself. So kind of how Simone hears Chidi's name and assumes, oh, right, we worked at the same university. I must have heard your name. All of these things that are happening just connected to her. Derek in the sky must be her doctor. You know, all of this stuff doesn't exist. It's really just in her mind. Which is interesting. Uh, it's it's very similar to how in the movie Inception, the architect or the dream builder mm-hmm. creates the dreams. They all, all the residents of the dreams, they're all extensions of the architect's self. Right. And um, drawing from their own memories or life experiences to create this world around them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So nothing outside of her mind has an independent existence. So as soon as Chidi is out of vision, he just doesn't exist anymore. That kind of thing. So Simone says to herself, you know, nothing's real. This world isn't real. It's all just a manifestation of her dying brain, but it's all connected to her. And we can definitely see this from a few different perspectives. Like, philosophy for sure but we can also think about it in terms of neurology like brain disorders comas tumors things that could be impacting someone's experience cognitive abilities Mm -hmm. but we can also look at it um, from the point of view of psychology like mental health and hallucinations and delusions and we can also think of it as a great example of just like science versus faith right right Because she's a scientist. She's rational. She's logical. So in her mind, it doesn't make sense to have an afterlife. So she's going for the most logical conclusion here. And it's scary. It's scary to think that maybe you've been wrong all your life. If you are a type of person that doesn't believe in the afterlife, perhaps you're agnostic or atheist, Mm -hmm. it could be kind of scary to know that you're wrong. Right, yeah. (laughs) This you know? huge thing that you've just believed your entire life suddenly shown in front of you as wrong? Yeah. And then you start wondering, wait a minute, how is it possible that I'm here thinking and is my brain is working, but my brain has also died? Mm-hmm. That's uh, <laughs> confusing. <laughs> I think it's kind of, it's just too much for Simone to understand. It's too much for her to wrap her head around. Mm-hmm. But I don't think that there's a super easy way to deal with that either. So I'm just very interested to see what they're going to do. The uh, Actually, there is a thought experiment called the brain in a vat that's very similar to what uh, Simone is going through right now. And this experiment is basically just an argument for skepticism and solipsism. So this brain in this vat is just being fed kind of these ideas and 
it feels that it has a body and it is moving and it is experiencing things because from the perspective of this rain, there's no way to tell if it's in a skull or if it's in a vat or it's like floating out in midair. It doesn't, you have no idea in a jar or a (laughs) vat, right? And we've seen a lot of really similar things in science fiction. I mean, you already said it, Inception, but there's also The Matrix. There's a couple episodes of like Black Mirror. There's even The Truman Show has that kind of, what is happening? I don't understand reality thing. Westworld, like you mentioned. And even that one random episode of Buffy where it seems like maybe she's just been hallucinating this entire show. Yeah, (laughs) she's in a mental health facility. Yeah. So it's a pretty common trope. Did you have more to add about Simone's experience? Yeah, it's, it's, there's a few things that are similar to what she's going through. Yeah. It's not quite the same, but I just thought it'd be fun to kind of explore the depersonalization and derealization disorder, where the subject feels a disconnect from themselves and their body and their thoughts, Mm -hmm. which is sometimes compared to viewing yourselves outside of your body or watching Mm. yourself in a movie or something similar to that. You're still grounded in reality. You still realize that things are real, Mm -hmm. but they're not happening to you. So it's it's interesting. Oh, wow. Some people, the things happening to them kind of feel like they're happening to somebody else. Right. Emotions are extremely disconnected from yourself. Like you don't really feel happiness or fear or sadness or mm-hmm. or anything. Or uh, even like if you're being hugged by somebody, it doesn't feel like you're actually being hugged. So you can't get that that warm, fuzzy feeling you get if you're getting a good hug or something. Oh, so that can be really scary, especially if it's somebody coming from somebody that you love or mm-hmm. care about because mm-hmm. you don't feel that from them anymore. Yeah. Because it's not happening to you. It's like watching yourself in a movie, mm-hmm. kind of, or watching someone that looks like you, that's kind of like right. you, but it's just fuzzy enough to not be you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oof, so these symptoms, they, they say that most people go through this at least once in their life, whether it's mm-hmm. for uh, a couple minutes or couple hours or very rarely a couple Mm -hmm. of years it can be a side effect from substance abuse um i know personally i've felt that for i don't know half an hour once or twice when i was younger i think i was going through a really high fever Mm. and i think that contributed to it Mm -hmm. um yeah so it can be a side effect from substance abuse or some personality disorders or even some brain diseases a lot of psychologists feel like uh, DPDR or depersonalization derealization disorder is a defensive tool for the brain to mm-hmm. survive emotional trauma. Right. That makes so, sense. So similar to DID, dissociative identity disorder, where mm-hmm. you're going through this horrific experience and your brain doesn't know how to handle it or it does know how to handle it and it either shuts down and you become an outside viewer. Whatever is happening, is not you're not going through it. Mm-hmm. It's happening to somebody else. Mm-hmm. So that way you can get through it Right. And not feel fear or terror or anything because it's not happening to you. Yeah. And on a much less scary scale, I mm-hmm. guess, that's kind of what's happening to Simone, right? It's like she can't deal and process all of this at once. Ooh, it's a lot of emotion. So it's easy <laughs> to just, well, it's not easy, but it's Write easier it to just push that away and go, hey, no, nope, none of this is real. It doesn't matter. It's right. fine. It's exactly. fine. It's fine. And I'm definitely not upset about being dead. <laughs> So I, that's so interesting, though. The mind is so cool. And we just don't know enough about it yet. We still yeah. are just kind of like grasping at straws when it comes to a lot of this. Yeah. Um, When you were talking about the DPDR, it actually reminded me of an episode, I think, of Hannibal, uh, when there was a subject who believed so f- completely that she was dead. I can't remember the name for this disorder, but it's like completely convinced that you're dead. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people don't eat. They don't take care of themselves because they're, they truly believe they're like a walking corpse. Right. And uh, so it's just interesting just how powerful the mind is. It's interesting and terrifying (laughs) and wonderful and amazing all at once. (laughs) And you'd already mentioned this before uh, the Truman show Mm -hmm. led into a lot of People call it the Truman Show delusion, right. which isn't recognized officially mm-hmm. as a an illness or a disorder or delusion or anything, but it is 
a lot of people have actually gone through that where they don't believe that anything is real. Mm-hmm. They're the center of everything and mm-hmm. everybody is just an actor. Right. So um, but that's, again, it's not exactly what Simone's going through, but it's something mm-hmm. kind of similar. It's interesting to think about. Yeah. Um, this actually led me down a very bizarre spiral of articles online. And <laughs> I thought this... Um, this philosoph- this philosophical argument was really interesting. I came across uh, one called the five minute hypothesis. Okay, which was hypothesized or kind of offhandedly remarked by <laughs> uh, a philosopher named Bertrand Russell. Uh, he was calls himself a skeptical philosopher. Okay, he says there's no logical impossibility in the hypothesis that the world sprang into being five minutes ago, exactly as it was with a population that remembered a wholly unreal past. There's no logically necessary connection between events at different times. Therefore, nothing that is happening now or will happen in the future can disprove the hypothesis that the world began five minutes ago. So there's no way, he says, there's just no way to prove that it didn't. Mm -hmm. Sure, we have memories. Sure, we have objects. But who's to say they didn't just pop into place? Yeah. So (laughs) I thought that was just really interesting. Like, how can we know? Yeah, that's the thing is it's so hard because people will come up with these thought experiments and there's not a whole lot of like immediately recognizable ways to say, well, no, that's not true. Other Mm -hmm. than, well, I feel like it isn't. (laughs) But in the show that we're talking about, The Good Place, that kind of stuff just happens. Janet will create a world in moments. And people will pretend that they have been there and they will act just like in the Truman Show, like Eleanor and her friends, they're all acting. All the not people that Janet made, they're all acting like human beings. It's Mm -hmm. just this world did pop up like five minutes ago. (laughs) And all the things that you think have been around forever in this, this being the good place, you're just taking our word for it, I guess. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Going on the five-minute hypothesis, there's also another very similar idea called Last Thursdayism, which is oh basically gosh. the same thing. <laughs> but it's, if the world was created, fully formed, and ready to go during the biblical time of creation, mm-hmm. then who's to say it wasn't created, fully formed, and ready to go last Thursday? I guess the idea behind it is if God created everything, Adam and Eve and everything fully formed, ready to mm-hmm. go, um, what about the stars in the sky that needed millions of light years before the light reached earth or the volcanoes that needed thousands and thousands of years to become formed and ready to spurt out lava and all that so did god create them already aged and right yeah so that was just yeah just uh, an interesting idea You're have like, all these memories been planted in our minds and have the fossils really been planted by god who's trying to trick us yeah and test our faith or like fossils <gasps> that have Um, One of the examples was fossils that have other animals inside of them. So Mm -hmm. like a fish that ate another fish, like was that fossil planted there with that other fossil inside of it just Uh. to show people that fish eat other fish or. That's a lot of work. I'm just saying like, (laughs) it's a lot of work to get all that stuff done for last Thursday, but act like it's been going on for millions of years. (laughs) <laughs> you also mentioned the the matrix mm-hmm. and that's another experimental idea that the world is just a simulation right so yeah and we're all just simulated and it's actually gaining traction over the past like decade oh gosh so it's i don't know it's kind of if you're interested in that sort of thing definitely look it up and read up on it don't worry you're still good you're still you just but don't just... go to like the red pill on Reddit because Brent is enough toxic masculinity, okay? But that's interesting because this world is a simulation. Mm-hmm. It is. It's literally an experiment. Like they are being experimented on. None of this is real. <laughs> so Simone's kind of right. So because Simone is right. Right. What I think they're going to do in the next few episodes or even for at least half the season, probably not half the season, but the direction (laughs) that they're going to go is Simone is not going to change her mind. Okay. She believes this wholeheartedly. She's a scientist. Yeah. She's going to convince Chidi that this isn't real. Oh. So the whole, the whole Chidi helping everybody is going to be flipped on its head because Chidi is going to be so confused and not know what's real or not that his helping people is going to be null and void. Ah! 
<laughs> and what might happen is they'll have to show Chidi his memories from the past, like Michael and Janet did with Eleanor, to convince him that it's real and that it happened or something. And then we're going to have to reboot the whole experiment. And then <laughs> issues from that are going to stem. And then we're going to lead into the finale. Man. So that's that's the that's what's going to happen. That's the roadmap for this season in my head. Okay. All right. <laughs> Calling it now. Jason was the first to come up with it if that's what it is. Okay. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's very... Um, complex what they've done with Simone it's not just like really funny but is definitely going to be a big issue because even if Michael decided to show Simone how she died on earth just like he did with Tawny so what right it's oh yeah I died this way okay no big deal like I don't think that that's going to convince her mm-hmm. and if she is not convinced that this is real what will make her act morally nothing, nothing. So that's the big issue. Uh, I really think that she's going to be the most challenging. And now that you're saying it, like, I think it's very possible she will influence Chidi because that little interaction is definitely not the last Mm -hmm. one we're going to get. But I think she's going to be the most challenging because Brent and John are kind of dumb and uh, they already believe they're dead. So And they believe they belong here. Which is baffling in my mind. It's just baffling. But whatever. Fine. Although Brent seems very much like, oh, it's the good place. <gasps> Couldn't it have been the best place? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's it's tough because in the first season, Chidi was Eleanor's flashlight. Can he be that for Simone? Or is she just kind of going to doom him? Like the Plato's cave allegory here. Is he bringing her out into the light to realize thing? Or is she going to mess up with his head so much that she forces him in? Brings him into the darkness. Exactly. Ooh. Ooh, this is so interesting. (sighs) That would be so sad, though. (laughs) Uh, Just the way you said that, the leading into the darkness. I'm like, no, Chidi. (laughs) Don't go in the cave. (laughs) Oh, man. Okay. So on a much less serious note, what do you think about the Derek, Janet, Jason storyline? Because that's our B story, basically. The B story was not very important to me. Okay. I also don't really like jealousy storylines. Right. They're very (laughs) annoying. I don't know. They're just because they always usually end up the same. Yeah. And I really feel sorry for Jason because him and Janet just seem so bizarrely great for each other. (laughs) And Derek just seems like a stick in the spokes. Just, I don't know. I I really don't like the whole idea of Derek being jealous and Jason being jealous and Derek trying to cut Jason down. And yeah, insecurity and jealousy and (sighs) every story does this and it's kind of boring. Yeah. I'm I'm always really happy to see Derek. I yes. I really like his storylines. <laughs> well, his very simple story, his yes. simple character. Yes. Um I just like his overall Derekness. Yeah. I just want him to do something other than be angry with Jason and mm-hmm. Janet. I think that he's the one that's really there to torture Jason. I mean, I know that the bad place had literally nothing to do with him, but now that Linda isn't there, there's no one kind of specifically for Jason. Mm-hmm. But I did like Jason trying to call a truce mm-hmm. and wanting to be the bigger man. Kind of disappointed that he did like an immediate turnaround and just decided to kill him, but also not that surprised. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well, I tried to be, but <laughs> I tried to be the bigger man, didn't work. Let's kill him. Yeah. Plus, it's one of those, uh, he's not really, he's not human, I'm not really killing him, so right. how bad is it kind of thing. I think that might cause a problem, though, if he continually does that, and then Derek just keeps getting better. So, honestly, a lot of Derek's jokes in this episode really did it for me. Like, I really liked him in this episode, so even though I didn't feel like it was super important that he was there, I really appreciated his presence. When Jason is trying to insult him and say, oh, well, you probably just made all the butts. And he just happily says, I did make all the butts. I made that butt and I made that butt. That part left. 
made me laugh so hard. I think it's <gasps> so <hard>. more Jason <laughs> Mantzoukas's essence. Yeah, his delivery yeah. and the way he just <laughs> carries Derek as a character. Like, yeah. There's yeah. not so many jokes as there are just the way he speaks and the way he acts and how dumb he is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. He said the whole, you crossed the Rubicon, which I looked up and that's a, a reference to Julius Caesar. <laughs> I'm saying it like that because I know very little about history. But maybe that's showing us how uh, he's getting a little bit smarter. He is. He is. I mean, he's, he's still been... eating his martini glass. But yeah, we're getting there. He had a glass of pickles <laughs> and a glass of onion. And maraschino cherries. Yep. When he was about to die. Yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. So, do you have anything else you want to go over? I was curious as to why the episode was named A Girl from Arizona. Mm-hmm. Because we've moved on from no longer a trash bag from Arizona. Mm. She's now just a girl. Right. She's upgraded. A person. Right. So. Okay. Yeah, I'm not really sure that I get the title either. I'm feeling like it might not be that important. Mm -hmm. But there are two episodes named A Girl in Arizona, or A Girl from Arizona, excuse me. So maybe we're going to get an answer this Thursday? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you have any favorite moments in this episode? Any fun little things that you picked up? I did like Eleanor's looks like we're going to have an SVU. (laughs) joke right near the beginning (laughs) yeah she's pretending to be or she's feeling like olivia benton from law and order svu which is fantastic i used to watch that show all the time (laughs) that was great yeah yeah i did like eleanor's board with the emojis Mm -hmm. i like that it's low tech but it's still fun and she doesn't want to put words because you know can jason read So she uses emojis. I really liked her acting out the emoji. That was very fun. And we see Chidi's apartment for the first time in four seasons. We have never seen a Chidi dwelling in our lives. Yeah, I thought that was kind of unique. Yeah, and it's pretty much what I expected it to be. A lot of books. Yeah, just like the study. Yeah. The study in the game Clue. Ooh, I like (laughs) that. I feel like that's what it's modeled after, actually. Huh. Pretty cool. So overall, how do you feel? Good. Good episode. I really laid the groundwork for the season. Heck yeah. And any potential twists that they're going to throw at us. They already had that great twist with Linda. Mm Mm-hmm. So I know they're going to derail us again. And I'm looking (laughs) forward to it. Yeah. I'm really hoping that the fake Michael is not the end game. Mm Mm-hmm. But I'm, I'm definitely hoping that Chidi gets sucked into Simone's psychosis. Well, I'm glad you didn't say cave. That would have been weird. <laughs> Her delusion, Her let's say. Yes. Not psychosis. Delusion. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Overall, I am very pleased with this episode. It's a good start to the season. And I had so many good jokes. Like, it was, it made me laugh a lot. So yes. I appreciate that. <laughs> Diving into our mailbag, we have a email from Chelsea, who... Really enjoys our podcast. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Thank you. (laughs) And you're saying you have a couple of questions about the first episode. And uh, she asks what we thought of the Linda Chris twist and making Chidi the fourth subject and um, how it was kind of in line to what other people predicted as far as Chidi being the fourth. Mm -hmm. We thought about that and it seemed like the most logical idea. I mean, yeah, I felt like it was a pretty good twist. Um... Yeah, we talked about it a bit. And... Making Chi do the fourth subject made the most sense. Um, so really, it, it didn't surprise me, but it was still surprising how they did it. Mm-hmm. And for your second question, you are wondering what our theories are and how they will manage to convince Simone that she is really dead. Well, we t- definitely touched on that. So I hope our discussion on that answered your question. Mm-hmm. Because I don't think they can. Mm-hmm. Chelsea wrote, I feel like anything really wild they could do to try to convince her would just bolster her coma slash dream theory. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I am totally stuck. (laughs) Um, I don't think that they're going to be able to convince her in a really easy way. I don't think it'll be showing her how she died or Janet 
summoning anything that she can think of, I don't think that that will work for Simone's case. Mm-hmm. Um, but as Chelsea writes, uh, maybe they'll go along with the route of convincing her to go along with things just in case it really is the afterlife. Right. Right. Because eventually she's going to realize she's been there for a while. So maybe she'll play along. Mm-hmm. First day jitters is what she's going through with the cheese hat and the uh, the phone mm-hmm. fingers. Mm-hmm. And yes, absolutely. Hearing Chidi forget Eleanor's name was very painful. <laughs> Did not expect that sucker punch within the first couple of minutes in the episode. Um, I actually kind of missed Chidi in this one. He mm-hmm. wasn't around a whole lot. He just kind of popped in a qu- couple of times. And I'm hoping that this isn't a running theme for the season because I would hate to start seeing less of Chidi. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Chelsea, for your email. We really appreciate it. Keep them coming. All right. We have a couple messages that were sent to us during the interim. Um, one message from Sierra says... I think that your memories change your personality. We're all deterministic creatures sending inputs through our neurons and computing outputs, and part of that computation involves considering what happened in the past. Of course, maybe if you don't remember, some of your instincts can be changed by events, so maybe some parts of their personalities will remain the same even after the mind wipe. Right, so there's a lot of science into that, actually, about people in a coma waking up and not having any memories of their past and being completely different people. Mm -hmm. because they don't have those past memories to shape who they are exactly and there's some fun movies about that actually like there's this movie called unknown where a bunch of people wake up in a farmhouse type situation and we know that half of these people are hostages and half of them are the captives but they don't know which are which because their minds have been or their their memories are all gone right so they kind of have to figure out who is who and at some point, you find out one of the people who believes they're the hostages was actually the captive, but they've their personality is totally different. Like they've become much better person, and when they find out that they were a bad guy, they're like, mm. "Wait, that doesn't make sense. That's not who I am." But right, oh, and this actually, Sierra, what you say here makes me wonder if Chidi's end up going to end up surprising all of us because. The bad place is just so sure that Chidi is just like this ace in the hole that they already know he can improve, but under different circumstances, without the memories of his team, can he improve in that same way, right? Will he have the motivation, the drive to do it? And Part of the motivation was his soulmate, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then what you were saying too, um, some of your instincts can be changed by events. And we've kind of seen that with the reboots, for sure. Everybody seems to still be better, even if they don't remember stuff. But Cheaty pretty much just seems like first day Cheaty, just excited to be here. So I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Thank you for your messages. If you want to send us any of your thoughts, we would love to hear them and discuss them on the show. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. If you like the show, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes. This is the best way for others to find the show. If you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio, and you can tag your thoughts with hashtag FBullshirt. We're also on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast, and you can also email us directly from our website at multiverseradio.ca. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Vivian. I'm Jason. And this has been Fork and Bullshirt. See you next week. <laughs>